Cannabis is a miracle herb. Yeah, it gets you high. But it also helps in the treatment of glaucoma, gives an appetite to those suffering from nausea, and in all likelihood a safer pain reliever than, say, opioids. Many edible mushrooms, such as lion's mane, chaga, and reishi, also have wonderful medicinal properties such as fighting cancer, managing stress, helping with diabetes and cholesterol. The list goes on. What happens when you combine cannabis and mushrooms? You get high fee wellness. Along with their cannabis partner, Dow Gardens, they have quite a breakthrough concept going with your wellness in mind. And today we have COO and co-founder Nick Chufo to explain it all to us on this episode of $5 Buzz. Step inside, lock the door behind you, make sure the towel is properly positioned. You're stepping in on another episode of $5 Buzz. Uh, We just really wanted to say thank you to everyone that listened to our previous episode. It really wasn't the um, most uplifting topic uh, with the unfortunate war in Ukraine, but uh, it really reached a lot of people and we appreciate the support. And if there's any small thing we could do to help uh, people feel a little comfortable or more knowledgeable, Uh, We're happy to do that. That being said, we're going to shift gears and talk about something today that's uh, a lot more fun and a lot more uh, useful and productive. And we're going to be talking about THC, mushrooms, and uh, new business ventures. So today, we're lucky to be joined uh, by Nick uh, Chufo, who is the co-founder and COO of a company called Hyphy Wellness. And he is uh, based in Eugene, Oregon. And uh, Nick, how are you tonight? Doing awesome, guys. Thanks, George, Peter, Roger. Appreciate the time. Good Good chatting. Awesome. And I know you're up in Oregon. Uh, Maybe before we talk about the origin story, what is going on in Oregon in terms of legalization of a lot of, um, you know, what most people would uh, be classified as illegal drugs or like can you educate the rest of the country on what's actually gone on because there's been a lot of distractions and other big stories that most people probably aren't too well versed in it yeah well obviously we've had medical cannabis for quite some time we legalized recreational cannabis in 2016 um since then yeah this past year has been a pretty interesting year in decriminalizing a lot of class one drugs Um, in addition to uh, passing Measure 109 to legalize therapeutic usages of psilocybin. So those are kind of the new buzz uh, topics that are going on in Oregon, which, you know, as far as the decriminalization of, you know, the other like class one drugs, I I haven't seen a huge impact of that, you know, on the community per se. Um, there's always been a pretty significant drug presence here. Um, so yeah, I mean, it is what it is. Hopefully we're not wasting too many resources, government resources, you know, to, uh, apprehend those individuals that are partaking in those drugs. So I think overall it's a positive thing. Um, but I think the psychedelic space is, is definitely having a moment for sure. So that's been really interesting to see how that's kind of rolling out in front of us. Um, and huge advocate, Although our companies don't really have any uh, stake in that game, it's uh, a really cool social movement. I think it's going to definitely impact a lot of people's lives. Yeah, it was interesting that, you know, there was a big scare that, oh, we're going to legalize heroin and everyone is going to go out and do heroin. But I think that uh, just because something legal, it wasn't going to grow the market uh, too significantly. Uh, and that's what it sounds like. But I think, yeah, I think normalizing some of these things to an extent, obviously normalizing heroin sounds kind of strange, but at the same time, when I think we create all this taboo and red tape around substances, whether it's as simple as alcohol or, you know, some hard drugs, I think that it uh, removes some of the allure for a lot of people. I mean, I, I lived and spent a lot of time in Italy and I mean, there'd be 12, 13 year old kids, you know, in the piazza drinking a bottle of wine, super casually, actually, composed and it wasn't a thing and they're not out there taking shots and being ridiculous it's something that they respect and they either partake in or they don't but it's not this thing that they feel like they're getting away with it's just kind of part of their culture and I feel like those are you know that's a page out of uh 
their book that we definitely could kind of implement in our in our culture to stop making sex drugs and all these things such a taboo that then people kind of fetishize them right so you're in oregon now but you grew up down near uh oxnard and southern california could you just give us your origin story about growing up down in that part of the world and yeah uh, for sure i grew up all over ventura county so right between santa barbara and la so a lot of my time spent in camarillo but i lived all over ventura oxnard el rio um so yeah i grew up down there big big ag area um big surfing yeah. enclave too isn't it like Ooh. ventura county a big like a community of surfers a lot of surfers i grew up <laughs> surfing huge yeah. uh, i'm going surfing this weekend actually on the oregon coast so <laughs> awesome. yeah yeah, huge uh, surfing advocate and ocean water person. Um, yeah, grew up in that area. Good, you know, good place to grow up for sure, um, for the most part. Did have an interesting upbringing in, in regards to my health. I was diagnosed with leukemia at age five. Wow. And, um, you know, now looking back in a lot of the data we have, you know, the agricultural hubs like like Ventura County, those rates are really high. They, especially back in the eighties, were definitely spraying eighties and nineties spraying ton of pesticides and herbicides, insecticides. So um, I lived literally by like strawberry farms and you know, like my backyard, I could go and like pick strawberries, for, you know, practically. So yeah, I was diagnosed at age five, had three and a half years of chemo, you know, definitely had a pretty big impact to say the least on my life, you know, missed most of kindergarten, all first, second, third, a lot of fourth grade, you know, um, finally was like healthy enough and kind of uh, socialized enough uh, once going into fifth grade to like actually, you know, stay focused. And yeah, that definitely, I think, uh, sculpted me in a, in a sense. I was, uh, you know, pretty much told I wouldn't be able to play sports or lift weights or have kids or any of these things. And like, Right when I turned nine and was in remission, I immediately joined the football team, played football my whole life, wrestled, played baseball, was one of the only kids in a thousand pound club as a freshman in, in high school. So definitely tried to always, you know, overcome and persevere some of the limitations that were set by, you know, some of the occurrences that I, I faced. And that definitely led me to, you know, always kind of think about health and wellness a little differently. Didn't, didn't happen overnight. It was a, a slow, slow progression of kind of just uh, levitating towards more like plant medicines and not drinking as hard as a lot of my cohorts and, you know, partaking in as many drugs as some of my, you know, friends and, and teammates and things and kind of levitated towards cannabis for sure. That was something that just definitely agreed well with my system and kind of enhanced a lot of my performance and athletics and tapped into a different part of the brain that I thought was really cool and creative and fun. And yeah, honestly enhanced my quality of life. And so that was, you know, my childhood in, Cam in Cambrio and Ventura County, then um, went off to school, went to UC Davis, studied international relations with a focus in peoples and nationalities. Um, then studied some beer brewing and food science with like the godfather of beer brewing, Charles Banforth at, at Davis. Just has fun, honestly. And then uh, moved abroad, lived in Siena, Italy, studied a language and culture program out there. Got really submerged in the whole wine scene and um, just kind of the, the cultivation side of wine, as well as the just the culture and wine itself. It was just a really fascinating realm for me. So and then when I finished up school, came back to the States. I dabbled in beer for a bit, helped start a couple of microbreweries in the Southern California area. Then from there, worked for the largest kosher winery in the world, Herzog Wine Cellars. Um, and while always kind of having cannabis in the background, never thought of it as a actual like you know viable career. It was more something that was very fascinating to me, you know, and and a, a fun product and all. And I I knew had a lot of efficacy medically, but didn't really see the path yet for any in a career in that realm. And at that point, started studying holistic nutrition with a naturopathic doctor down in LA and really diving into health and wellness and went like raw vegan and was like really diving into like endurance at athletics and, and really tapping into performance nutrition. And while, while doing that, cannabis kind of kept popping up in research and, and things and a lot of things on not just THC, but THCA in the acid form. 
as a dietary supplement, not as a psychoactive supplement. So I started kind of messing around and having fun with uh, pressing cannabis, actually juicing cannabis and, and making different elixirs with the juice and definitely saw some insane results for performance and was just kind of messing around and then started you know, thinking about uh, the, you know, just nutritional opportunities there and the health opportunities there. And while that was happening, Jeff was up in Oregon. He was finishing up his studies at U of O and had the opportunity to get involved with one of the very first cannabis companies or uh, a startup that was going to try to pursue the very first recreational cannabis license in the state. So he reached out to me and, you know, pretty much presented an opportunity and was very confident that if I came up, we'd be, um, you know, successful in receiving one of those first licenses. So I did move up my family, came up here. Um, we worked on that project. We're successful in, in receiving one of the very first recreational cannabis licenses in the state, then a uh, processing license, wholesale license. Then we moved on quickly saw that that group wasn't really going to be the group that we worked with and had different philosophies. They were definitely more, uh, yeah, more money driven and just different, different motives in general. And so Jeff and I branched off. He went, you know, the STEM route or before it was even STEM and was working with TJ's, which is one of the first vertically integrated companies in the state. I went the Dow Gardens route and I started a no-till regenerative holistic farm. And yeah, so took that project on and we're going, we've been going ever since. And um, about two years ago, a lot of a lot of research started kind of surfacing in the mycological realm, and at that point, I already had a good amount of information and foundation of of you know holistic nutrition and fungi were one of the things in my arsenal that I used for a lot of different you know a lot of different um, purposes, and yeah, so we kind of I had a couple of things kind of fall into place that started making a lot of sense to me to put some energy into starting a functional mushroom company. So I reached out to Jeff kind of full circle, hit him up and was like, Hey man, like think uh, we should have some discussions. I think there's opportunities here. Let's talk. And we assembled Hyphy Wellness and yeah, we're going ever since going hard on, you know, just him and I essentially, we've just been doing a ton of research and development, we're cultivating, we're extracting. Uh, we were the and first- You're talking about all kinds of mushrooms, cooking mushrooms, all kinds of things. That Yeah, those... pri primarily what we call functional mushrooms. So, you know, lion's mane, shiitake, re reishi, cordyceps. So these are all non-psychoactive or you could say non-psychoactive. They could, you know, some of them might have some minor psychoactive properties but they're all culinary or you know medicinal functional mushrooms no psychedelic no psilocybin mushrooms but no portobellos no portobellos no maybe but mushrooms, we'll mushrooms are fascinating in that way that they yeah. have these properties that are kind of unique to each one right i mean that that that's a that's a very interesting feel that it's super interesting i mean the one of the biggest misconceptions most people refer to them as plants they're not plants so there's a mushroom kingdom. They're part of their own, their own, um, you know, sect. And they, you know, there's literally thousands of different species. So it's not even like you just have mushrooms. You literally have all these different genetics. And some of them are like completely opposites when you talk about genetically and the compounds and the secondary metabolites and how, you know, some can kill you, some can heal you. It's, uh, yeah, it's pretty vast. And we're still just brushing the surface. Honestly, we're learning every day a ton about all the different strains, but really trying to hone in on a couple to like try to, you know, master those and become an expert in all the different procedures that are involved in producing products, all single source closed loop. So and cultivating them, cultivating them. Is there, there's no difference in the lab than in nature, right? Because they are just what they are. Uh, actually very different. So very so different. Yeah, I mean, they're, you know, we're cultivating usually on like a, a cube substrate. So either some type of uh, sawdust or grain. Mm -hmm. So in, you know, in nature, they're going to be growing either in soil, you know, just like mycelium networks all on the, on the forest floor, or they're going to be growing off of natural wood. So off of trees. So that's essentially where you're going to find all your, all your fungi naturally. So, I mean, we are in a sense, we're trying to emulate that, that substrate, 
indoors, but you'll see they express themselves very differently in. Do they? What, what are like? What, give me an example of just how wildly different they can be. Uh, well, you know, reishi is a perfect example. So, you know, reishi in in the forest is going to have literal uh, spores. They're it's gonna they're gonna have you know pores essentially underneath. And when we grow them inside, they literally don't have any pores. They grow these antlers. And this is the cultivar, at least we're, you know, the reishi strain we're using. I'm not going to say I can, I know all the reishi strains, right. but what we're growing grow very differently. They literally look like deer antlers. They don't have the same characteristics at all. And uh, yeah, super, super fascinating. And we've seen similar things with lion's mane and just a lot of nuances with the, with the indoor compared to so what you say is naturally. You see a stem with a head on it and then a stem coming off of that stem with a head on it. Kind of like, is that what you're talking about? I mean, so where it would like, instead of growing in a uh, cluster in, in, the, in the soil and in, in nature, here they're growing on top of each other. Yeah, sometimes, or just literally grown with complete different structure. So having like, you know, in nature, reishi, for instance, will have like one big cap, and then there will be polypores underneath, where in, in our indoor facilities, they're growing literally out like, like fingers, and like literally look like a, like an antler. So yeah, pretty, pretty cool. And I think that has to do with the substrate and obviously environment, and there's a lot of, a lot of factors there. But been really fascinating and also coming from, you know, I'm not necessarily a, you know, a cultivator of cannabis, but obviously uh, overseeing lots of cultivation of cannabis and seeing the, the side by sides. And it's in a lot of ways like opposite, you know, they're, the mushrooms are actually breathing oxygen. So um, they, you know, they're needing 90 plus percent humidity. They're needing, you know, totally like almost the opposite environment that we try to mitigate on the cannabis side. So that's really fun and kind of fascinating. And um, yeah, it's been been a really cool adventure. And, um, you know, one of our first project, collaborative projects between my two companies was the Lion's Man THC Gummy, which has been a really, really engaging kind of like conduit between the two, the two industries and a good conversation, you know, starting point for a lot of people to understand what these functional mushrooms are, what they do, how they can be used in an entourage effect with other compounds such as a cannabinoid and those impacts on the body. So that's been that's been super fascinating to see firsthand from you know myself using these products, let alone seeing all of our consumer base and just rave about these products and you know talk about the actual quality of life increases that they've seen with the usages of, of these products. Well, how does cannabis mixed with the lion's mane mushroom in particular i mean can you give you know i've looked at some of what you've written online i just want to you know for the folks at home what do they what do how does the lion's mane enhance the um the, the cannabis or how does the cannabis enhance the lion's mane's properties what well, if I took it right now, what would I experience? Yeah. So, you know, first I kind of want to preface by we're doing studies right now. We're, you know, conducting research studies to understand more actually what's happening. So a lot of the information I'm going to tell you right now is anecdotal. These are from, you know, our experiences, our clients' experiences, not a, you know, a decent populace, but I wouldn't say enough for to, you know, conclude a research study. So that being said, what we've experienced. So first thing we know about, about, lion's mane is, you know, kind of as a blanket statement, just an easy, easy uh, description of how it's impacting the body is it's increasing blood flow to the brain. It's helping with neurotransmissions. It's helping with nerve growth. Uh, but the blood flow to the brain is really key because cannabis is breaking your blood brain barrier. And obviously the faster you have blood flow, the faster your uptake of cannabis is. So meaning the short, the, that shortens your activation time. So you eat an edible, takes 45 minutes to an hour, depending on your body, you know, body composition. When I take a- So you're lion, saying we get high quicker. <laughs> yeah. So when I take a lion's mane THC dummy, I'm a, I'm a pretty big guy, weigh, weigh 230. It takes me usually like an hour plus before I'm feeling anything. I'm literally within five to 10 minutes feeling the, first, the onset of, of the THC. Damn. 
And, and then I think what's also cool about that is it doesn't just come and slap you and hit you in the face like a lot of edibles where you're like, hour in, I don't feel anything. And that's what a lot of people start just kind yeah. of piling it on. Oh, I need to eat two more. This exactly. is, you know, I, got, I got some duds. And then they're like freaking out, having an anxiety attack, you know, an hour or two in. With the, with the THC, it's almost the opposite. You know, it's this really smooth, kind of sustainable uptake of the THC um and and the come down i would say also is like a little bit calmer not as much of a crash so much so that we have clients reach out that say they haven't ever really been able to consume thc because of all the adverse effects and anxiety that they experience from the high until they tried our gummy and literally have a couple clients that are like we eat your gummy every single day now and i went from not being able to have thc only eating cbd to now eating some of your lion's main THC gummies literally on a regular basis. And I just thought that was fascinating to hear from people that have had, you know, a lot of negative experiences with THC. So to answer your question, I think, I think we're just uh, brushing the surface. I think there's going to be a lot of cool blends of different fungi. You know, we've taken lion's main as the first to kind of understand that, but I think that we're going to find that cordyceps and reishi and turkey tail and chaga and all these other compounds are going to interact really cool with, not just THC, but other cannabinoids as well. You know, um, I mean, THC, if, you're, if you're a cancer, CBD. if you're a cancer patient and you're waiting for pain relief, and this yeah. and this speeds up the pain relief in the same manner that it would, as you as you talk about, you know, not taking the hour for the pain relief to sit in, but rather in ten minutes, that is truly breakthrough and really truly wellness. Uh, it, you know, as far as I'm I, concerned. I believe so. I really do. And I have, I have family members personally that have terminal cancer right now. And, to hear that. you know, yeah, you know, it's part of life. It's unfortunate, but these are products that I feel, you know, very fortunate to be able to, you know, provide for them and them have access to, and they've definitely uh, expressed the same, the same feedback as you just depicted that. I mean, they're, they're using them side by side with other products that they're purchasing and they're not seeing the same, the same benefits from some of these other products. And I think it also is because we, we cultivate and process such a pure therapeutic grade cannabis as well. So we're not using any chemicals, any bottle nutrients, you know, all of our procedures are above and beyond a a medical grade. Um, But also I think, yeah, these other compounds in conjunction with, with how we, how we do everything is really, really fun to see it impact people's quality of life. And obviously people struggling with more, you know, adverse health situations are seeing some really amazing impacts of these products you think? not to mention like assholes like me who've eaten a hershey's chocolate bar white chocolate bar eating one quarter of it and then finishing the whole thing in one fell swoop and then having the after effects of that of an entire night of being completely petrified <laughs> no i mean i know as much as anybody that you know, these products can be you know, overconsumed and if taken in the right dosage or the wrong dosage, wrong time can be really unpleasant. And my goal, you know, for all of our, our products is to make sure that they're essentially done, you know, carried out the opposite and dosed the right way and, you know, carried out in a fashion that it's, uh, you know, a little bit more uh, gentle of an experience. And obviously for the people that want heavier dosages, we have products like that as well. I have a, you know, a thousand milligram, edible, you know, tincture beverage with lion's mane for the heavy hitters that need, you know, three, 400 milligrams per, per hit to, you know, actually feel anything. So everyone's you different. You build yeah, a tolerance, don't you? you? People build tolerances to especially the same types of strains and the same, you know, that's kind of inevitable with THC, isn't it? 100%. And also THC is converting into a completely different compound into your liver. So when you're eating edibles, there's people that have a terrible, you know, really low tolerance when combusting, when actually smoking cannabis, but then they can just like eat hundreds and hundreds of milligrams of edible THC and be totally chill. So, and vice versa. So it is really fascinating how people just metabolize THC in different forms. And um, I'm kind of more like I could smoke a good amount, but man, I'm super sensitive. I mean, if I take one milligram of THC in an edible form, I feel it. It's funny. I'm the opposite now. Now, not then, I should say. I could eat 40 milligrams, but you give me two hits off of a bong, I'm fucking stoned to be Jesus. Take 40 milligrams, I'm riding okay. Yeah, it's crazy. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about the cordyceps uh, um, edibles that you make? Because I remember for a while I was taking cordyceps 
when I was doing some like athletic training, like some CrossFit type stuff, because I read some where that um, the cordyceps were, were trying to help you with your breathing. And I had like some sensitivity with uh, my nose. I wasn't, you know, I'm like a mouth breather. And I read that the cordyceps could aid you in like some of these really intense, low duration uh, exercise. Uh, is yeah. that correct? Yeah. So, you know, right now we're doing a ton of R&D. We have actually have not yet to date released a Cordyceps project um, or product to market, but hopefully very soon. And just a little background on Cordyceps. So they've been feeding, uh, Cordyceps have been fed to horse races. Or, um, yeah, Wait, race what horses. is a Cordyceps though? What, what is it? It's a mushroom. Oh, it's a mushroom. It's, yeah. it's a varietal of mushroom, right? Interesting. Yeah, yeah. It's a cultivar of mushroom. Um, South America, is that where it comes from? Like Chile? Prim yeah, primarily. And and it's also very, very difficult to cultivate. So it's one of these really strange mushrooms that actually is a, um, like a parasitic mushroom that actually attacks, it attracts ants, essentially, to um, once it eats it, it uh, and I may be skewing some of this, but it attacks its nervous system it shuts down its brain but before that actually has the ant essentially go to like one of the highest parts of the tree it dies and then it colonizes through its body so it actually will grow out of the ant's body so look up some videos really really fascinating how i feel like i've seen some of that crazy stuff on like the blue planet or something like that yeah the time lapses are yeah. insane Fucking so, grows right out of an ant it literally grows out of its brain so it's like taking it over as like a host, essentially making it go to its graveyard, essentially, and then it's populating out of out of its brain. And but you'll we see all these eat. dead, and you'll see all these dead ants with with cordyceps growing out of their bodies. That's crazy. But we can yeah. eat. So that's but we can eat it. So so yeah, they've been given to racehorses for endurance. It's known to increase your VO two max, and pretty much like oxygenate your cells. So. A lot of endurance athletes take it. Um, I definitely take it. It's a really interesting product. And um, yeah, tough to cultivate. There's only, you know, a, a dozen or so mass producers, you know, or, or commercial cultivators in the United States, um, but getting more and more prolific. And there's a few people that have kind of pride themselves on, on educating on how to cultivate these mushrooms and and carry that out so yeah it's a it's a i think that's one of our next our next one we're working on reishi right now and the cordyceps the uh, the next product development that we're kind of going down would that market be towards athletes that enjoy to use thc uh as part of their routine like i remember arnold schwarzenegger famously is like he would always smoke before he lifted like way back in the the old days, but I'm assuming that there are a lot of athletes that do like to smoke or, you know, consume THC uh, before an event or like, it's just part of their, their life or their process. And this cordyceps sounds like blending those two together could have a pretty cool effect I'd imagine. Completely agree. And to be honest, I haven't, I haven't yet other than like smoking and taking a cordyceps or something, but as far as in one, you know, elixir or one, one product that would be really really cool and i think i think it could be something that yeah it could be a you know just a, a house home a household you know product essentially that everyone kind of focuses on taking around yeah as a pre-workout or just endurance type of product um i think they're you know they're very different obviously cannabis and and how it's having an impact i mean cannabis is gonna it's gonna have a vascular impact on your on your system but also can actually inhibit some of your oxygen uptake. So, I mean, especially if you're smoking, yeah, mm -hmm. you know, that's just going to have a negative impact on, on your lungs and, and your oxygen uptake. But yeah. So, I mean, the cordyceps are super fun. That's definitely a really cool, really cool uh, product that I think is going to be super big for us. Like I have to ask, um, you know, given your, your close personal relationship with cancer and, it being the plague of the 20th century, do you think the cure for cancer lies within this, these mixtures or THC or, or do you think that we'd have a better shot at finding a cure for cancer going down this road than the road they are going down with it? Yeah. I mean, you know, obviously that's a loaded, loaded question and uh, I'm not a, I'm not a medical doctor, yeah. but from all of the, you know, my experiences, research, everything that I've studied, I think that 
you know, there needs to be more of a hybrid approach to, mm -hmm. to health and wellness. And I think that one of the, one of the things we miss in Western medicine is that, you know, we treat when there's disease, we don't treat before there's disease, you know, and the way we read labs and the way we read vitals are very one dimensional, you know, you're either sick or you're not. And that's just not the reality. You know, these lifestyle, age, environment, all these things need to be factored in when you're looking at someone's holistic health. But unfortunately, you know, only 7% of Western doctors have any nutritional education. So when they're looking at these, you know, reports, they're just working with the knowledge and the foundation that they, you know, worked under. And I mean, in a critical situation, we have some of the best doctors in the world, but as far as a preventative situation, we just don't look at medicine, unfortunately, like that. So, you know, to, to direct your, to your question, I mean, yeah, I think, I think fungi could have a huge impact on this. I think that there's lots of compounds and, and natural approaches to health and wellness that can, you know, rid the body of free radicals and potential hazardous, you know, compounds. And I think that we're also on some, you know, on the precipice of something pretty big with fungi and understanding our, our gut microbiome. So, you know, our microbiome is made up of, you know, 70 plus percent fungi. So the fungi in your gut is essentially balancing your microbial health, which is then dictating your psychological health, your mood stability, your energy, your nutrient uptake. You know, you literally have like a mycelium network in your body. So, to, and we don't know anything about that. I mean, we literally are, are just starting to learn about the gut microbiome and understanding how that's all interacting. I think that that could be something really groundbreaking to understanding the relationship we have with fungi and that it's in the soil. I mean, it's the building blocks of our world. Like there's, there's theory that the first thing here was a mushroom before any of us, maybe one of the oldest living organisms. So that's fun and kind of, you know, oh, man, it's, <laughs> it's fascinating to think about. It's, it's so exciting to think about. Wow. That's awesome. Yeah, yeah. Why don't we take a little break and then I I would like to talk about just like the whole business aspect of it with like the laws and all the taxes and how you guys have a plan to, you know, um, get it out to the wider world and and like maybe, you know, deal, I'm sure you guys get approached by investors and all types of stuff. So maybe we could talk about the business stuff and the future of it. Hey everybody, this is Eric from Slate River Farms. You may remember me from episode one, titled Farm to Toilet. I'm just dropping by to remind you to please follow $5 Buzz on Instagram. Subscribe wherever you get your podcasts and hit the subscription bell on YouTube. That way, you'll never miss an episode. The Buzzards have some great content locked and loaded for season three. I know I'm excited. Also, please check out Slate River Farms' website and our socials. We raise and sell certified grass-fed, grass-finished beef and pastured heritage breed pork on our fourth generation family farm in upstate New York. Order online and we'll ship our goods directly to your doorstep via one day shipping for all of New England, New York, New Jersey, and PA. From our pastures to your doorstep, life gets crazy. At SRF, we believe in peace, love, and pork chops. Hi, ladies and gentlemen. We're back again here talking to uh, Nick Chufo. It means a granule of herb or a lock of hair in Italian. So uh... isn't that appropriate? <laughs> My goodness. <laughs> All right. So a couple of ways I've noticed on your website that, you know, obviously you guys have developed uh, working in a sustainable way of producing your products, right? And sustainability has been the sort of buzzword for eons now for in the last 15 years. And I just did a whole movie about it, you know, called the flow that's still not done yet. That's partially about it. Um, but beyond that, you're also using, you're doing local deliveries now, right? Mm -hmm. And that you're using electric cars specifically, and they have a pretty cool name. Why don't you explain a little bit about your growing methods and your delivery system? Yeah, for sure. So, I mean, all of our inputs are sourced from organic farms, biodynamic farms. All of our inputs are consciously sourced, um, whether that be on the cannabis side, the mushroom side, everything, you know, we do. We try to put a lot of time and effort into making sure that we're procuring, you know, ingredients and, and base materials from, you know, the best, best sources possible. Um, 
In addition to that, we did a you know partnership collaboration with Arcimoto, which is a local electric vehicle manufacturer here in Eugene, which is pretty cool. You know, we don't have a huge manufacturing hub here, but they're definitely some pioneers. They're doing some really, really, really neat, innovative work. Um, they're doing these what they call uh, fun. Uh, utility vehicle. Sorry, draw a blank for a second. FUV. So that's actually their tag on on the um, stock exchange, and they're really cool. They're these little two seater electric vehicles that technically fall in between a car and a motorcycle. So they actually have steering. They don't have steering wheels. They have handlebars. Um, most of them don't have doors. They are putting doors on some of them, and it's a it's a really cool vehicle all electric charges in you know a couple hours plug it into a regular you know 110 outlet it's a really neat apparatus for sure so we partnered up with them we have a whole wrap you know a, a custom logo wrap on on the vehicle and anyone that places an order on our website or calls in locally we do a delivery in our in our ev yeah, you're gonna to have to put some doors on those. You guys get a lot of rain and a lot of snow too. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So the heated seats, heated heated steering wheel, but uh, we do have some gnarly weather once in a while here, or maybe more than more than not. And uh, yeah, yeah. So they're working on that. That's definitely the biggest feedback is you know put doors on it. That's cool. And we're trying if they put doors on it, we're actually then legally allowed to deliver cannabis in them as well. So right now it's not compliant with the OLCC to deliver in essentially a motorcycle. You can't uh, deliver so, cannabis on a, on a, on a, on a bike. So that's a state regulation that they have to deliver uh, in a car. In a car, you're supposed to have a lock compartment. There's a lot of uh, red tape. Oh, I guess that makes sense. But you can have a lock compartment yeah. on a motorcycle, man. Definitely. I agree. They also, you know, talk about just safety of the driver. Makes sense too. Cause you know, who knows how stoned they might be. <laughs> Fair enough. Nick, do you have, um, can you just tell us a little bit about uh, your organization? Do you have plans to be a multi-state operator or will it be, will you guys be confined to Oregon? Because I know that there's a lot, maybe you could tell us about that too. A lot of red tape, a lot of legal um, exertion put on uh, businesses such as yourself. And it seems like a lot of folks that <clears throat> come up with great concepts, like what you guys are doing have to spend a lot of their time uh, reading about the laws and the restrictions and all types of uh, administrative uh, burdens. Yeah. So you're, you're obviously talking more on the THC side, right? Yeah. So, yeah. So 100%, I mean, we are currently working on collaborative projects um, out of state. So we don't have any actual production um, going on anywhere, but Oregon currently. But we, you know, us being California guys, we definitely have always had our finger on the pulse of the California market, which I mean, for lack of a better word, has been a shit show. Um, so we've kind of just watched from afar and uh, kept kept close eye on it. But it's just kind of, yeah, it's kind of a, a messy, a messy scene right now with the tax situation and just so much money to for entry points and a lot of kind of, you know, bad products and oversaturated and all that good stuff. So we've kind of just sat, wait, you know, wait for the dust to settle. And now is actually our time where we're about to launch a high fee THC gummy in the, or in the California market. So nice. that's going to be really fun. And I think that mushrooms have, have been and high fee specifically has been a good conduit to other States because we're doing some fun, innovative things here. So even going into a saturated market, like the California market with this really fun, engaging product, gives us a different light you know we're not just like okay cool we're, we're growing good cannabis or oh we're making another gummy and it's you know made with therapeutic inputs well everyone says that yes we might have an edge and we're doing things differently but it takes a lot of time to educate your consumer base for them to understand why so yeah to answer your question 100 you know we want to perfect our trade and our craft and that's why we haven't really rushed to expand in other states we've been expanding rapidly rapidly in eugene and in oregon but as far as, um, you know, multi-state, Jess worked on lots of multi-state operations and um, now helping Dow kind of follow that path as well. So yeah, we're, we're super excited. But now, as far yeah. as the legalities to kind of point to that, I mean, we 
one way we're kind of finding loopholes essentially is just finding pre-existing operations. They're up and going, they have their licenses, they have product processing SOP, everything kind of locked in. And then we come in and we, you know, provide product development. And so essentially this is what we want to create. You guys have the licenses, you have the raw materials, we'll help you with SOPs and bridge that gap and help with branding and distribution. And that's essentially what we're doing specifically for the California market. You know, in the wellness space of things, it does seem to me that there is a, a lot of opportunity for people that might be in it only for the money. And how would you advise someone, a person, go, well intended, going out to get something for their wellness, how to discern between a truly a company that's truly into wellness and a company that's truly into profit? Because it seems as though even amongst your own, there's there's a different there's a different outlook on that. But the difference between a snake oil salesman and the real. Well, yeah, I mean, you, you know, there's a lot of there's a lot of gummies out there you see on the shelves that are colorful and and all that. There's some that are straight up. They they all have different packaging. Is there is there anything that could key just a regular Joe looking to help themselves into what would be truly well for them? Right. If you follow me. Ah, that's an excellent question. Excellent question. And, you know, there are, you know, there's some little indicators I can definitely point on, but to kind of blanket answer, it's really tough, man. It's really tough. It's something that we try to make accessible to our consumers every single day. And we struggle too to educate, you know, the Education. intake managers, the owners of these dispensaries come in and do vendor pop-ups to engage with our consumer base, to really build, build the, you know, the ethos and the company culture that, we're doing and actually let that be known from the from the actual end end user and but you know to back up a little bit i mean there's certain things so you know i would say companies that are doing solventless products for the most part you know are trying to do things a bit cleaner and one thing with solventless it's like you can't a lot of the extract world in general it's taking really poor inputs and we say you know as a kind of slang polishing turds so you're taking some, you know, pretty poor quality, you're extracting it with hydrocarbons, butane, propane, a kind of blend to rid all the molds and contaminants from this product to have a, you know, high grade or a high potency THC. But we still don't know all the science behind what are the, what are the, uh, you know, after effects of having those molecular interactions of these hydrocarbons, cannabinoids, what's leaching, what's not actually vaping off when you're, when you're drying these products and what's actually being consumed and how is that interacting with your biochemistry? I personally think that they are very unhealthy products. I would stay far like away DVD from- Like DVD oils and stuff like that? Not, not just all the oils, but primarily the solvent base. Mm -hmm. you know, hydrocarbon specifically, I would, you know, anything that's made with a hydrocarbon, in my opinion, is something you want to be very careful with. I'm not saying that you can't make a hydrocarbon product and have it also be safe. I would just unfortunately say that most of the companies that are doing it aren't carrying that out. Um, so, you know, all of our products are all solventless. So we're literally using ice water and, and heat. Those are the two, you know, Essentially, you know, ice water is our solvent and then heat is our, right. and, and pneumatic pressure is our way to, you know, final stage extract. Right. So I would say that, you know, that would be a good, a good indicator if they're solve if it's solventless uh, gummies or solventless edibles, if it was a really, really bad starting quality material, it wouldn't pass testing. Because if you're doing a solvent list, you're just going to concentrate molds. You're going to concentrate pesticides. You're not going to be able to extract THC out of that and leave back these contaminants. So, and that's also what's so awesome about it because you're getting all the other compounds. So you're getting all the terpenes, you're getting all the other cannabinoids. And um, I think it's a more therapeutic product in general. So that's one good indicator is just keeping it solventless. Also, you know, farms that pride themselves on being no-till or regenerative soil or holistically managed. So those are terms that unfortunately are also misused 
you know, just like we throw around the term organic and all these catch terms in the food world, same deal with cannabis. It doesn't Everyone take long it. for someone to catch on without regulation or, I mean, even with regulation, there's still, they, you still can abuse it. Yeah, we're a true no-till farm at Dow, and we're always fighting, you know, against people that are like, oh, we're no-till or have no-till literally in their name. And I know for a fact they're not, you know what I mean? It's a, and it's not necessarily they're bad. It's just like misrepresenting what you're doing. And it's not right. educating your consumer base. And it's just using these catch phrases to, you know, as marketing leverage. So that being said, if you're, if they're truly, you know, asking the bud tenders, asking the people, how is this cultivated? Where is this coming from? What's the substrate? Is it hydro, you know, grown? Is it grown in soil? Is it, you know, a bottle fed nutrient? And the issue is a lot of times these people aren't going to know. It's like, oh, I have no clue. It's, it's bomb. It's 30% THC, you know, but at least asking. And then I think also that's an indicator. If you go to a shop and they just don't know and they're just selling whatever, go to a different shop. You know, there's plenty of stores out there where people yeah, actually care. Yeah. They smoke what they're selling. They go mm -hmm. to the farms. I mean, we take our bud tenders, we take our managers, we take our store owners, we bring them into the farm. We're like, hey, we will show you every single thing we're doing. We want to be completely transparent. And that's just not the reality of most farms. They don't want you coming and seeing how disgusting their facilities are, all the, you know, wall of nutrients and chemicals that they're using. You know, it's just not a, not a pretty thing. Our garden, very different. You're seeing red clover flowers. You're seeing all the companion plants. You're seeing a very clean facility. Yeah. The air quality is amazing. You walk into a room, nothing but awesome smells, no molds, no like dingy, musky aromas like most facilities. And, and so, so that's, you know, I would say just asking questions, like that's all you really can do is just see how vested the people selling these products are into the specific products and not just talking about THC. I think that's an issue. It's all about, well, it's 32% THC. That doesn't matter. You can have some super toxic, really, really, hazardous material that's very high in thc well, yeah let me ask a question all of that you know that you're paying attention to exactly what you're doing that all has to come with a cost so let me ask what <clears throat> what is your i don't i haven't really looked at what your cost breakdowns are i mean is this something that right now you're marketing just explain to me what what were the cross the cost analysis versus you know what you like i can get a box of gummies for 18 bucks 10 milligrams each 100 milli 10 of them you know for 18 dollars on um ease out here in california mm -hmm. so what would something like this you know comparatively cost about double it's like about an double. easy yeah that, i mean that becomes you know. because of the care and what you were doing and what's involved with the process as well as what's infused with the with the cannabis yeah primarily what's infused like obviously we're using organic sugars and we're not using any you know dyes or we're using all all clean products on that side but as far as the input i mean the hash is really where where the money's at so it's like you know we can go buy i can go source dissolute 100 percent or 99 percent thc dissolute for a buck a gram my products cost $10 a gram, you know, and to produce easily costs $5 a gram just to produce one gram. Copy this. So that's, you know, you know, easily five times just in the cost of goods. Okay. That is the struggle with anything quality made food wise that you consume in this fucking country. Yeah. It's more expensive to get healthier things. It makes no sense. Because you can't just scale up a craft high quality company trust me i try yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know like you have bottlenecks like you just you know we with extraction is a perfect example we bought you know crazy high-end apparatus to run 10 times the amount of material in a day than we can do by hand and this thing is you know we're getting way worse results we're getting degraded product we're getting lower yields we're not even getting the results we need to get from these bigger batches so we're like going back to the basics. We're doing everything by hand now and in smaller, you know, smaller lots and we're getting higher quality, better results and actually making more money in our realm, you know? So yeah, it's tough, man. I, that's kind of, you know, I'm a big picture a guy. Place. I want to continue to expand and get bigger and bigger. And I, and we are, and we're going to be really strategic in the way we do that, you know? And the reality is we're never going to be the, you know, the level of, uh, 
Marlboro, you know, growing cannabis like they do tobacco. That's just not something we're interested in. That's not something that's, a, you know, it's in opposition to all of our ethos. Sorry, Roger. I, for one, cannot wait to try a hyphy gummy when they get Me the too. Over here. Send that shit to us. It's ready, man. Yeah. Yeah. Send me send me an address. Let's get you guys some product. Hey Nick, um, I know we only got a few minutes uh left. Don't want to take up too much of your time, but you know, just to the point of getting the product to, you know, California and maybe some of the uh, eastern states. And I know Oklahoma is like the wild west right now. They're uh the other guys we work with on uh, the show in the rotation, they said anybody they'll write a license to, on the back of any napkin and give it to anyone but you know and as you scale up and the ambition to uh grow obviously you probably want to be in every market that you possibly can be have you guys been approached by like the investment community or like some of these institutional investors that um like i would imagine at some point you would need to take on some type of partner in order to grow the business employ more people transportation etc i mean is that the case yeah 100 percent. and and um you know in the cannabis space it's been really fascinating because it definitely uh <laughs> attracted a certain type of individual that you know maybe wanted to hide some money move some money do things so we've had to navigate around a lot of that which you know we're trying to do above board legal businesses and part of doing that is taking above board legal money and smart money, not just easy, quick money. So yeah, we, we get approached, you know, a ton by lots of people that are in, interested in, you know, buying our companies, investing in our companies. And early on, we definitely learned, you know, by some mistakes for sure of taking, taking resources that, you know, in the moment were, you know, seemed like a necessity and were something that we needed to get to the next stage, but definitely weren't from, the sources that had longevity and sources that would actually support us in our true vision. Just people that wanted, you know, quick money, fast money, thought that they could make the returns like it was a black market industry. And the reality is this is a very tough industry. It's farming end of the day. There's razor thin margins if you're doing it the right way. And it's, you have to be in it for the long haul. And I feel like the people that don't have the passion behind them, they, they, lose their interest and they move on. And that's okay, you know, because end of the day, a lot of money has flowed into this industry and the people lose interest, lose money, they leave. A lot of the, that money did, you know, empower people, created jobs, created, you know, access. But as far as expanding, we're very, very critical of where this, you know, where this uh, these funds come from and capital is raised. And yeah, we have a lot of people that are, you know, super fascinated what we're doing want to be a part of it. And um, we're just trying to be as critical as we can because we want to work with the right people and and make sure that they also have the right intentions and that you know money money's cheap man you know that's all I can say like we can there money is everywhere and not to sound you know fool myself or anything but we have no issue with raising capital it's about really the social capital and and raising it with the right people that that care that we enjoy being around that's you know share similar visions that we can learn and grow and and progress with so that's really our goal you know i'm 33 have a family have a six-year-old hopefully more to come and i want to you know set something up for them you know i want to set a good example and do business in an ethical way and it's also kind of sad because you know capitalism is a vicious cycle man you know like a lot of people out there making a lot of money in really strange ways. And it's not necessarily because they're smart, but because they've found a loophole, they found, uh, you know, an angle. And I mean, mul multiple billionaires will say it themselves. They're not, you know, they're not as talented as you think. They're just creative and able to capitalize on a flawed, flawed system. So we yeah, don't want to be like, yeah, <laughs> I was going to say, you know, obviously, the cannabis industry is ripe for to be, uh, you know, exploited by the banking industries, the big investment banks and, you know, all that go, you know, the financing that goes around with it. But it seems like most people that I've heard from and uh, have the same attitude as yourself, you know, social equity is obviously a big part of, uh, you know, a lot of these legal, uh, the legalization, but it seems like everyone's just cool and interested in doing the right thing and not necessarily, Hey, let's just IPO and, 
you know, extract as much resources from the community as possible and then fucking move on and, Hey, we'll go do something else. You know, we'll do rinse, repeat, because a lot of times that's what happens. And the, uh, the, the, you know, the guys and ladies that found the company, they're, they're just looking to get out and dumping a bad investment on the public. Now, like all these pensions and 401ks and everyone's owning the, these bullshit companies that, um, Hey, if you believe in the company, why are you selling? You know, that's, I come from the finance world and that's something we would always ask the guys, you know, like, Hey, if, if you believe why are you selling? You yeah. Know? Not everyone's and, the same, but it's, you know, a lot of times it, it was a, let's just make as much money as possible. And the evaluations are fascinating. And like the biggest evaluations are usually by the people doing the least amount of things. You know, like all these like publicly traded Canadian companies are like, we're evaluated at 150 million. I'm just like, you literally not produce one product. You have a team of science, a panel of scientists that claim they have IP and that's it. And you're worth 150 million. Like it's, it's fascinating. And yeah, like you said, I mean, there's a pump and dump mentality, you know, in all industry. I mean, Wall Street, that's how people make their money, but it is, it is really interesting to be navigating through that flawed capitalistic mentality of, you know, just make quick money, turn and burn and leave everyone in your, in the dust, you know, don't, don't think about the people, the careers that, you know, that's the most empowering part of my job. And what I do is I, you know, my employees are buying houses and, you know, really carving out a career for themselves, showing up to work every day, referring to their job as their dream job. And for me to think about, you know, failing and their dream job going away is probably one of the biggest motivating factors to making sure that I'm successful and that I don't, you know, take for granted this opportunity I have to, you know, create these new lives and, and, you know, paths for people. It's, you know, two years ago, we had five employees. We have 30 plus employees now. And, you know, to see them show up every day with a smile on their face, super stoked and literally buy houses with weed money. It's pretty, pretty dope, you know, with legal, legal cannabis money. It uh, definitely helps, uh, helps push through some of the tough times for sure. Okay. Millennial, just before we wrap up here, I just want to ask you nice. one thing, cause you've got a bunch of Gen Xs right here. Give us some of your favorite music. Because it's going to help. We always have a little music element added to this thing. So I just wanted to know what you listen to when you take one of your gummies. Nice. Uh, well, I definitely grew up listening to a lot of Steely Dan. Uh, Pink Floyd was, uh, you know, Led Zeppelin, all the old school stuff. Um, obviously, I love a lot of reggae. But I would say that... If I'm going to take a gummy, go work out, I'm probably bumping some some hip hop. I'm probably listening to like Freddie Gibbs or maybe some Logic or um, what else? J. Cole. Um, Freddie yeah, Gibbs man. didn't smoke. Freddie you just gave yeah, our uh, man, Nate, Nate, who does all of our, we always have a element that's a, a music element that we put on on spotify on, along with us you just gave him a bunch of names to list for there's always a soundtrack every podcast and, and then two two more names especially if you're trying to really like chill out low-key tom mish out of control and then french kiwi juice oh, french kiwi juice i don't know what the fuck that is. <laughs> if you well, haven't listened to those dude you guys are gonna okay you guys are gonna All love right. it dude. that's what that's what we came for yeah super yeah. talented <laughs> musicians yeah <laughs> So uh, around the horn there, George. Yeah, Nick, I really appreciate your time. And, uh, you know, um, I, I think we'll be hearing from you again because, you know, uh, one of our uh, other shows that we're involved with, uh, I know those guys want to talk to you. So I'm looking forward to hearing more. I'm looking forward to what you guys are doing in the future. And, uh, yeah, man, uh, good luck. And uh, I, I don't think uh, – I think you guys are going to be really successful. So, uh you know, I'm looking forward to hearing more, you know, seeing the stories in the future. Well, thank you so much, man. I appreciate it. And it's, you know, people like yourselves, that give us an opportunity a voice and, you know, some time and some, some spotlight because yeah, man, I'm keeping my head down and just grinding most of the time. It's fun to just kind of actually take a, take a second to smell the roses and talk about, you know, some of the things we're doing and gives me, you know, a little bit better perspective too on what, what the future has to bring for us. And, 
I think we're going to do some cool things and make some, you know, neat impact and the success. I mean, if that comes cool, but I just want to try to pave the way for people to have, you know, more access, like we've talked about, it's, it's going to be fun, man. Yeah. Yeah. Man, to, to what George is saying, we like to strengthen that type of signal for, for people that are doing good. And, uh, it was really a, a pleasure hearing your story and your, in, in your, from the beginning, man, and you, you laid it out quite well for us all. So, uh, we appreciate you for that, man. Thank you. Cool. Thanks so much guys. Yeah. I got to get you guys some products too. So please hit me with your addresses and we'll get you some samples. So Nick, I, I do what we call closing it out. <clears throat> so I just want to again say thank you very much to Nick Trufo from High Fee Wellness or High Fay. Doesn't matter which way you want to say it. Wellness out there in Eugene, Oregon. Get your gummies, get your how many, you got a lot of different products, right? I mean a lot of different products. You can get a website. Get, you can go to get hyphy.com. And that's G-E-T-H-Y-P-H-A-E.com. Yes, sir. And you can see our whole lineup there. If you're in Oregon, you can definitely look at Dow Gardens, Dow Bubble, Holistic Cash, uh, all kinds of cool collabs. And then, you know, for the Californian uh, people watching, definitely keep an eye out for Hyphy, dude. It's going to be making some waves. First adaptogenic yep. lion's mane gummy with THC on the market. So, yeah, man. Fucking A. I'm going to take some THC right when we're done with this podcast. And I just want to thank all the listeners out there who just spent last hour listening about these products and our man, Nick. And I want to thank everybody out there who is there trying to support the problem going on in Ukraine and the invasion by Mr. Putin, that fucking piece of shit dickhead. And I just want to say, if you have any questions, comments, any ideas for topics and or guests for our episodes in the future, um, please email us at five dollar buzz and that's f i v e d o l l a r b u z z at gmail.com and we'll get back to you. But I, you know, quite frankly, I just took four of those gummies and a freight train's coming, so it might be a little bit before I get back to you. Love you guys all. Peace out. Thanks, Peace. Dude, thanks, Nick. <laughs> <laughs>